Hello everyone, I'm Bradley Barth, Senior Reporter at SC Media. Welcome to today's webcast titled, The Next Evolution of Malware, sponsored by Blue Vector. Destructive disk wiper malware has become a new weapon of choice for cyber attackers, allowing them to produce highly effective, debilitating, and costly attacks against their targets. The Not Petya wiper attack introduced a new dimension to these attacks, adding a ransomware component that experts say concealed the malware's true intentions. This session will look at the destructive nature of this malware, how it operates, why current malware detection may not catch it, and how newly developed techniques with supervised machine learning can help. Our speaker today is Travis Rasick, Chief Technology and Strategy Officer at Blue Vector. With nearly 20 years of experience in the security industry, Travis is a highly accomplished cyber defense leader who has spearheaded several commercial and U.S. government programs. He's known for developing and executing strategic plans to build the technical capacity across product development, quality assurance, technical marketing, professional services, and sales engineering. Prior to his role at Blue Vector, Travis served as CTO at Tycon and federal CTO at FireEye and held senior roles at CloudHash Security, McAfee, and Defense Information Systems Agency. Now, as a reminder, there will be a Q&A following this presentation, so I would encourage you to type in any questions that you might have for our speaker, speaker via the interface. Uh, and so with that, I'd now like to welcome in our presenter. Uh, Travis, thanks so much for being with us today. Uh, thanks for the, uh, the great intro, uh, intro Bradley. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, with that, I'll uh, jump into the slide deck and um, start with the presentation. Uh, so uh, definitely grateful to have everybody on board today. Um, and uh, definitely uh, hold your questions until the end. We'll have a Q&A session uh, as well. Okay. Uh, so the next evolution of malware. As Bradley was mentioning, um, you know, it, it's continuous, continuously a cat and mouse game. So the adversaries, uh, their intent and goal is to adapt faster than the cyber defenders, and they're always, they're very cunning, and they're always finding new ways to, uh, to have impact. Uh, so, so obviously, you know, what, what we've learned is malware isn't going away. Um, you know, uh, ransomware and destructive malware have been in the news prevalently over the last year or two, uh, and that's, that trend's uh, unfortunately going to continue in uh, uh, most likelihood. Uh, so here's some staggering t statistics. Um, in, uh, since the beginning of 2016, there's been roughly 4,000 ransomware attacks on any given day, uh, and that's a several hundred percent increase from prior years. Uh, I, I think that trend is only going to continue. Um, obviously, we're seeing uh, very targeted attacks against different uh, industry verticals, uh, healthcare, for example. Um, healthcare data is uh, very susceptible to those types of attacks, and obviously nobody wants to lose uh, medical records. Uh, so just wanted to uh, give an overview of malware, um, just to level set the audience so, uh, and give some historical perspective as well. So malware is software that is intentionally created to damage computers, computing devices, computer systems, uh, and have other types of uh, in impact. Uh, and so historically, um, you know, over the last 10 or 15 years, uh, you know, it, well, originally malware was really kind of focused on uh, fame, getting recognition and proving that, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the malware author could actually uh, defeat or thwart certain systems, uh, and it was more of a badge of honor. Uh, then over the years, um, from nation states and then getting into uh, companies, uh, it began transitioning into espionage and uh, and or uh, intellectual property theft. So the goal and intent there was instead of investing billions of dollars to research and develop emerging technologies and advanced technologies, uh, organizations, um, you know, specifically nation states, uh, became very uh, akin to uh, instead of investing, you know, that amount of money as well as waiting 10, 20, 30 years for that research to uh, turn into reality, um, it, it's just easier to steal the data. So there was a major onslaught against um, uh, Silicon Valley, high tech sector, the U.S. government, U.S. government contractors, um, and that's just within the United States. Obviously, the, this was international impact as well. 
But the whole goal and intent there was to uh, rapidly advance uh, certain technology sectors within other other uh, countries, as well as, um, you know, if it was initiated by certain companies, to have a competitive advantage. Uh, so that's uh, that's one aspect uh, in use cases for malware. Uh, simultaneously, around the same time frame, and still continuing today, uh, distributed denial of services uh, is, is still a uh, uh, you know a common uh, use for malware. So to initiate and drive a, a DDoS attack. So the goal with that is to impact availability of systems. So if um, so, what we've seen in years past are kind of indicative approaches. So if an, an organization, a um, uh, some type of a, a terrorist group or uh, uh, organization, a, a rogue nation, for example, doesn't like or believe in certain values or messages uh, or certain actions that were taken. Um, a common retribution uh, that they'll do is take it out on a specific website that's, uh, that they disagree with or organization um, where, where that resides. And they'll initiate some type of a DDoS attack and, and essentially make those websites inoperable. Uh, next, the uh, transition of focus uh, of malware became more around financial gain. So what we're seeing with uh, ransomware is, um, you know, being able to get access to uh, a victim's machine, whether it be a, an individual or a company, um, encrypt the files, and then basically extort them for uh, you know, hold that information hostage or ransom and, and, and uh, gain some kind of financial uh, uh, reward from that. Uh, and then lastly, the other aspect is more on the destructive side is disrupting the business. So wanting to have some type of permanent damage and effect of an organization's ability to uh, conduct their business. Okay, uh, so uh, over, an overview of destructive malware. So uh, essentially the definition is malware created to withhold, destroy contents of, or physically destroy information systems. Um, so the uh, a few examples of this, you know, around uh, Stuxnet, uh, some of the Dark Soul attack that occurred um, a few years ago in South Korea. Um, but essentially at the high level, that's uh, the intent of uh, the destructive malware. Uh, so I'll go with, and elaborate on a few different types of destructive malware. Uh, so some type of uh, wiper software, multifunctional wiper software, as well as ransomware. So th three different use cases, uh, and uh, these are defined by uh, the US CERT and the NCIC. Uh, and these are some examples. Uh, so Stone Drill and Dark Soul are a form of uh, a general wiper software, a multifunctional wiper. Uh, what's uh, known as Shamoon or Distrack, as well as Ghost Rat. And then ransomware, what we've seen in the news more recently around WannaCry and uh, Petya and Locky are, are some flavors. Okay. So what's driving um, this proliferation of uh, uh, destructive malware? So a few different things have happened. Um, obviously, the uh, the release or an uh, unauthorized release of certain nation state hacker tools. Uh, so, you know, the ability for organizations to uh, uh, leverage uh, some of the uh, leaked information and tool sets that have been used uh, and created by, uh, for example, the United States Intel community. Um, the other aspect are, you know, the uh, uh, the pro proliferation of the deep and dark web, so the ability to sell exploit kits and capabilities for basically anyone to download and buy. Uh, some of these actually come with service level agreements, so if it doesn't work, um, you know, they can, they can uh, get a new variation of the tool set, and hopefully that one works, uh, which is, you know, a, uh, a booming business uh, on the black market today. Also, um, a lot of these tools are becoming more mainstream. So they're kind of uh, what we used to call back in the day were script kitties. So they, they weren't the uh, red teamers or hackers that were actually writing the code and the exploit. They were 
using a, a, a graphical user interface and point and clicking, you know, enter an IP address of a target and clicking a button uh, for it to be successful. So some of these tools are essentially being uh, leveraged to where they can basically sell to a much uh, larger mass of, of audience. Uh, and the other aspect is the uh, prevalence of cryptocurrency. So anonymity is key, uh, especially with respect to ransomware. So with, uh, for example, Bitcoin, is incredibly popular these days, and the ability to monetize and, and remain anonymous uh, for this type of activity is, is uh, definitely critical, and that's definitely uh, helping drive this growth. Okay, uh, so I just wanted to discuss a few examples of some type of destructive malware. Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm sure most of you have, have heard of these uh, over the years, but uh, uh, Stuxnet obviously was uh, generated a lot of uh, uh, press over the last few years um, with a lot of the uh, the leaks to media, but uh, it was believed that the uh, uh, the sophisticated attack leveraged multiple zero days uh, zero day exploits targeting uh, a very particular brand of pro pro uh, excuse me uh, programmable logic controller PLCs, uh, specifically brand Siemens, uh, that was being used by the Iranian government in their nuclear power plant. Uh, uh, enrichment facilities, uh, and it was targeted to actually physically destroy the centrifuges. Um, and the other uh, aspect of that was that through the uh, HMI screens, the human uh, machine interfaces, that from the operator perspective, it, it, uh, it fooled the operator into believing that everything was operating as normal. Uh, the, the other large um, uh, destructive malware, which, uh, which in this case was uh, a wiper software that uh, uh, destroyed the master boot record and essentially made the system unbootable, uh, was Shamoon. Uh, that impacted 30-some thousand uh, systems and uh, it impacted uh, a large uh, oil company in, uh, in the Middle East. Uh, more recently, um, the Ukrainian uh, uh, power grid was... Uh, uh, disrupted, causing outage to hundreds of thousands of customers within that country. Obviously, it was believed to be uh, by a certain nation state or nation state sponsored activity, uh, and it was leveraging a, uh, an attack called NotPetya, or the tool called NotPetya. That actually, uh, there was a lot of work to emulate the actual Petna uh, ransomware, so it was uh, masquerading as Petya. And it took a couple of days for uh, security research to identify that, you no, know, actually this was a, uh, a different type of attack. Uh, another one that, that occurred pretty, uh, pretty re prevalent uh, starting last year was uh, called Locky. Uh, it actually used a much stronger form of encryption, uh, RSA and EES encryption. So uh, it was much more difficult to undo the impact. Uh, that caused a lot of organizations a lot of pain over the last couple of years. And then obviously with WannaCry, uh, more recently this year, uh, impacting hundreds of thousands of organi organizations globally. Uh, and it leveraged zero-day uh, exploits and um, uh, remote access tools that were generated by uh, government entities. Uh, so this gets back to what I was talking earlier around the proliferation of nation-state caliber capabilities into the hands of organizations that are less capable. Uh, the unfortunate thing is, obviously, it, uh, uh, the impact uh, is very detrimental, uh, even though that the, uh, the actual operator uh, it may not be as skilled as the, the person who created it. So it, it's definitely level the playing field. Uh, and the, the, uh, you know, talk a little bit about some of the victims that have uh, been publicized over the last couple of years. You know, one thing to note is not everyone comes out uh, when they are impacted by ransomware and or some form of destructive uh, attack. So, you know, it's, uh, nobody knows the exact number of uh, statistics or examples. So, um, <clears throat> 2013, uh, several South Korean banks were a target uh, believed by uh, the Lazarus Group, uh, which is uh, tied to uh, North Korea. Uh, and they were using a, a tool called Dark Soul uh, that impacted several banks within uh, South Korea and broadcasting companies, and it physically destroyed 
uh, and over with the MBR files on 30-some thousand computers. Uh, there were some estimations on the cost of the impact being in uh, several hundred million dollars. Uh, another highly reported um, destructive malware attack uh, occurred in uh, November of 2014, uh, revolving around uh, Sony Pictures. Uh, it actually was believed to be tied to the Lazarus Group as well. Uh, there were, you know, tens of thousands of social security numbers uh, that were released, as well as private emails. Uh, and a lot of business practices within the company that, uh, you know, ultimately the, the impact is, you know, uh, more than just physical damage to the systems. Uh, there's reputation, the lawsuits, a lot of other things uh, that must be taken into account uh, with respect to any of these types of victims. Uh, Saudi Aramco, uh, so, uh, apologies, this is a typo. This actually occurred in 2012. Um, and uh, it was a lot of uh, press around uh, Shamoon or Distrack as the, uh, the piece of destructive malware. Uh, in, in this case, uh, there was 35, roughly 1,000 computers that were, uh, that were wiped and uh, inoper inoperable, uh, revolving around the master boot record as well. Um, Saudi Aramco supplies around 10% of the world's oil supply, and this had dramatic uh, impact on their ability to deliver and, um, you know, exchange and trade oil on the, uh, the market. And Saudi Aramco, by the way, is the uh, highest valuated uh, company on the planet. Uh, and uh, something more uh, close to home here uh, in the uh, East Coast was uh, one of the large healthcare uh, uh, health care providers uh, in the Washington, D.C. metro area is MedStar Health. Uh, it was also hit with um, a form of uh, ransomware. Uh, it wasn't publicized which, which flavor or variant, other than it took, um, it basically shut down the, uh, the hospital. Uh, they had to trans transport patients out to other clinics and hospitals in the area. Um, obviously, they didn't have access to patient records, so they weren't able to, you know, conduct surgeries. They weren't able to do some of the tests for some of those patients. So beyond just the financial impact of the system's damage, uh, recovery fee, um, but also, you know, it, it can impact lives because they couldn't seek medical attention that they needed. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's lots of other uh, impacts uh, financially uh, or beyond financial in this case. Uh, so these are just some examples of some of the uh, victims that have been publicized over the last few years. Uh, as you can see, it's Basically, every uh, industry vertical is uh, impacted here. There is no, uh, there's no safe haven or safe industry to be in. Um, I think I saw a metric, a stat around uh, between 18 and 25 percent, almost of every industry vertical, uh, about a fifth to a quarter of uh, every company in the industry vertical has been impacted by some form of uh, destructive malware and or ransomware. Uh, which is pretty sad, pretty pretty staggering, and I can only imagine that uh, those percentages percentages are going to increase. Uh, and then uh, to go with what I just said, um, the uh, the Internet Crime Center's uh, uh, report shows that the uh, the amount of ransomware has uh, doubled uh, year over year, if not faster, over the last several years. And uh, unfortunately, that uh, uh, in, the, in the case of the IBM survey noted here, uh, with an interview across uh, 600 U.S. businesses, showed that 70% of the ones that were impacted by ransomware uh, paid the ransom, uh, which is uh, obviously is uh, you know condoning the behavior and obviously encouraging them to uh, continue uh, uh, down this path. So uh, another topic to, uh, to discuss is around, you know, why the attackers are, uh, uh, and the, the, uh, the malware uh, authors are being successful and why they're continuing to uh, progress down this path. Uh, so, so one aspect is around avoiding detection, uh, and, and that's, that's why they've been successful and, and, uh, uh, and they're continuing down this, uh, this path. So, uh, cyber criminals are and, and the ability to gain access to uh, uh, antivirus technologies and other types of malicious software detection capabilities 
is, is one means, the familiarity with how they operate and knowing how to game the system or defeat the system uh, obviously helps ensure that they, uh, uh, they can be successful. So essentially, if, if you have a, the questions to a test before you go take the test, it's a lot easier to pass it. Uh, and, and that's a similar analogy with what's, uh, what's happening today with uh, a lot of these cyber adversaries. Uh, and the ability and the prevalence to get access to some of these tools, whether it be directly or through third-party services, uh, obviously is another way to um, make that more successful. And more of the well-funded or uh, organized groups obviously have other means to, uh, to get access to certain capabilities if, if, if they're deemed as an impediment for their success. Uh, also, on the, you know, uh, on the black market and the deep and dark web, you know, cyber criminals are, you know, sharing successes and failures across, you know, what works, what didn't work, what vulnerabilities um, are more susceptible than others, more likely to be uh, exposed than others. Um, the other aspect to, uh, to note is a compliance requirements. So a lot of industry uh, and regulations around cybersecurity are well documented and publicized, so it's it's no surprise to know, um, you know, what the PCI requirements are, or HIPAA requirements, or FISMA requirements uh, for specific industry verticals. Uh, and a majority of organizations and companies are really focused on achieving compliance. Uh, typically, that's how they're measured on success. They're not measured on success for being secure. Um, so. Uh, you know, these attackers go after gaps in the compliance requirements because they don't keep up with the threats. Um, and that's another way they're able to avoid detection because a majority of the times organizations are only implementing the bare minimum or the check the box to be compliant. Um, and they're actually using that to their favor. So, why will they be, uh, still continue to be successful um, for the foreseeable future? Uh, here's a uh, statistic uh, that 94% of people couldn't tell the difference between a real email and a phishing email, um, which is a little higher than I would, uh, I would have guessed, but it's pretty close to you know, uh, what I was expecting. Uh, you know, the, the adversaries have been pretty crafty as far as you know, trying to trick or social engineer folks to, to click the email. Um, you know, with, you know, coming from, pretending to come from bosses, family members, uh, subject lines that maybe resonate with the target. So uh, with the advent of social media and the time spent to actually research their targets, so, um, you know, if, if, uh, if there's specific organizations or people they're targeting, um, you know, they'll, they'll actually uh, do homework and try to figure out how to social, best social engineer the person uh, based on connections, family, um, things that might hit home for them to where they, they just react and click and, and don't really scrutinize the email. Um, so you know, always the best practice is if, uh, if you're not expecting an email with an attach or a link uh, from somebody or they typically don't send you something, uh, it never hurts to send them a text or give them a call and, and verify before you uh, actually do click. Um, but obviously that's a challenge if you get you know, tens or hundreds of emails a day. Uh, that could be a challenge. Um, so some other reasons why uh, uh, those, uh, they've had the success that they, uh, they have had over the years. Uh, patching isn't a silver bullet. Uh, it's very difficult to be 100% patched across your enterprise. Um, you know, with service uh, outage requirements, you know, all, you know, only being able to bring down the server maybe once a quarter. Um, all the QA testing associated with uh, baselines and, and impacts the critical systems. Um, it, it's, it's, it's not really practical to be fully patched 100% of the time. Uh, so there's always going to be attack factors. Um, another aspect is a, a robust backup and recovery system isn't always in place. Um, and even if it is in place, it's not always necessarily tested. So w when you do need to use it, uh, have you validated that you're uh, your backup and recovery process actually works. So exercising and drilling that to make sure everything's functioning properly um, before something bad happens generally helps ensure the success of uh, when you actually need it.
Uh, the, the other aspect, um, you know, with uh, uh, enhanced features within uh, cybersecurity software uh, that comes off the shelf, there's a laundry list of configurations and settings. Uh, not every setting out of the box is in, enabled to uh, ensure the broadest and uh, most robust protections. Um, there's always trade-offs between, uh, you know, uh, volume of events, uh, you know, depending on the level of sophistication of certain users and the depth of them to uh, of the team to actually cultivate all the events uh, to determine which is malicious and uh, or not. So uh, some of those some of those settings are actually really effective or disabled by default. Uh, and some of the COTS uh, cybersecurity software, you know, such as endpoint software. So um, that that's another uh, avenue of attack. You know, knowing which settings are off by default. Uh, it definitely helps the adversary to be more successful in bypass detection. And um, the, the other component here is uh, the workforce challenges and shortages. Um, I, I've never met an IT team or security team who, who um, uh, has a lot of downtime. So the ability to do, to do read up and, and look at new and emerging best practices and actually uh, um, digest that knowledge and implement it in their day-to-day -day job, you know, they're definitely not, um, uh, you know, they're, they're definitely not uh, drowning in free time. And, uh, you know, being overworked uh, definitely uh, uh, aids to the uh, adversary's advantage here. Okay, uh, so I wanted to put some uh, financial impact uh, to the success of, um, in, in this case, ransomware and uh, um, some of the malicious software that's out there. Um, so specifically around cyber crimes, so the actual aspect of stealing money via uh, the cyber realm, uh, the Internet Crime uh, Complaint Center uh, from the FBI said that in 2016, uh, there was over $1.33 billion uh, associated to uh, cyber crime. Um, another use case uh, out of that same organization said that uh, uh, via spoofed emails from CEOs, um, they, they, there was attempts to steal over $5 billion. Um, so, for example, if you had a purchase order or work order that pretended to look like um, it was coming from your CEO saying to go pay this uh, and wire the money here, um, that's an example of, of what they're talking about. So in the cases it reported to, uh, to that group within the FBI, um, those tallied up to over $5 billion, uh, which is pretty staggering. Um, and then uh, the, the last uh, metric on here, which I think is um, really compelling from the Atlantic uh, uh, .com, uh, Datto suggests that uh, the f actual financial impacts of, uh, of ransomware uh, is, in, is in the range of $75 billion uh, over the last year. Um, and the reason that's not so much the uh, just the actual transactions to pay the ransoms, it's actually um, the impact to uh, clean up the systems, it's the, uh, you know, the company closing down core business, you know, money lost, uh, reputation lost, the actual um, loss of maybe company data, account data, et cetera, uh, and the overall impact to the business uh, generates around $75 billion just for, just for ransomware. So there's a lot of secondary, tertiary uh, uh, cost factors associated with, uh, with these types of attacks as well. Uh, so that leads me to uh, another requirement, uh, the need for speed. So, you know, it, it typically um, cyber defenders have really focused a lot on, you know, uh, post-mortem or post-breach types of detection, um, you know, when the main, the main impact was really cyber espionage uh, and intellectual property theft. So... There wasn't, you know, obviously without losing that data, it's, it's pretty detrimental, but the cost-reward factor of trying to catch and stop it quickly, um, you know, just hasn't been there over the years. Uh, in the case of ransomware and uh, disruptive malware, you know, once the, uh, the adversary gets a foothold in your network, uh, they're more than likely uh, going to act immediately or as soon as possible before they're detected. Uh, so, it, you know, it only needs to avoid detection for a short period of time, and then it's going to take action. Uh, it's not really going to focus on dwell time and sitting there and stealing information over years and being stealthy. 
Uh, so it's a whole different kind of mon model and construct. And it doesn't necessarily fit the model of security organizations today and what compliance requirements um, were designed to mitigate against. So you know, the ability to detect the threat, uh, isolate and contain it rapidly, and then eradicate it um, is uh, you know, more, than, more critical now than ever. Um, otherwise, you know, organizations can have catastrophic events uh, and um, impacts. I, I'd say that the, uh, uh, the small, medium businesses that are hit with some form of ransomware or destructive malware, uh, there's definitely a growing percentage of those that are actually going out of business uh, because uh, the impacts are so detrimental. And obviously, they don't have resources for security teams, and obviously, uh, you know, the speed of detection. It, it just doesn't exist in those organizations. Okay, uh, so mi minimizing the impact. Um, so the, a few recommendations here on trying to uh, li limit the impact of destructive malware and ransomware. So for example, uh, the first question is, where's your information? Where's your critical and sensitive information? Where, where does it reside? Um, you know, there's a whole, uh, there's an old phrase or saying around all, or all of your eggs in one basket. Uh, in, in the case of uh, Lockheed and WannaCry, you know, organizations that are doing um, online backups, um, you know, the, the ransomware adapted over the years and actually will connect out to those network shares where the backups are uh, being stored and actually uh, uh, encrypt and hold those ransom as well. So uh, in that case, all that information is, you know, in, in one basket as well. So you want to make sure that uh, you, you know where your information is. You want to make sure you're backing it up regularly. As well, you want to have offline backups. So in the event of, uh, you know, some of those newer uh, ransomware uh, examples, uh, they're not impacting uh, your uh, your data storage uh, as well. Obviously, you want to continue to, uh, to practice good hygiene and security configurations. Uh, keep current with critical patches and, and as many patches as, as possible within your environment. Um, uh, another good practice is best practice is uh, employing least privilege across your enterprise. So making sure that uh, your users and uh, system services are running uh, with the bare minimum uh, privileges necessary to do their business and, and job functions. Uh, for example, you know, all users you know, running uh, with local admin credentials or uh, some type of domain level credentials uh, is typically uh, a, bad, a bad idea uh, in the event uh, uh, that those privileges and uh, accesses can be hijacked and, and used to propagate within the enterprise as well. So uh, definitely leveraging uh, some type of least privilege across the enterprise is uh, highly recommended. Uh, the, the other uh, component is around uh, you know, threat detection capabilities. Um, you know, whatever you have uh, around antivirus, signature base, and uh, non-signature base capabilities, obviously trying to make sure that those are as current as possible. Uh, you know, uh, uh, word spreads pretty quickly when new variants come out, so um, and new outbreaks around ransomware. So uh, that's that's obviously uh, very critical. Uh, however, they've been pretty pretty effective at evading some some types of detection technologies. So good hygiene and preventing uh, the attack vector is is really a, a key point. Uh, another key area is to try to disable macros within uh, you know inbound emails and, and office documents. Uh, in, uh, with, within your enterprise as well. Uh, disabling macros will help uh, reduce that attack surface and um, mitigate some of the attack techniques that are uh, uh, being used today. Uh, a lot of these attacks are conducted via spear phishing or targeted spear phishing. Uh, so that's, that's a very uh, common attack vector. Uh, and lastly, awareness training. I, I think it's really good to um, uh, establish some type of security awareness training and specifically focus it around ransomware and destructive malware in your environment, uh, educating your users what to watch out for, what to look for, um, as well as best practices around how they handle their, their critical information, uh, especially around the company and how they back up. Um, you know, uh, maybe don't leave all of your, your applications and systems remotely connected to remote shares. Um, 
all the time, only connect when you, when you need them, uh, as an example. Okay, uh, so in the event you are affected by ransomware, um, so ironically, uh, the FBI is, uh, doesn't support paying the ransom. That's what they recommend that you don't do. Uh, but it's ironic that, uh, you know, an IBM survey that, you know, roughly 70% of organizations pay the ransom. Uh, and the issue is the cost that, um, well, the FBI says not to pay the ransom, typically because there's no guarantee that you're going to get the, uh, your information back or be provided the key to unlock your data. Uh, and then if you do pay the ransom, then they may send you another ransom for more money, right? So there, there is no guarantee you're going to get the data back or all the data back. Uh, so, and it also condones the activity. But we, you know, obviously what we've seen is organizations do pay the ransom. Uh, for them, the, the cost and impact um, is way greater than uh, the, uh, the amount that they're asking for in ransom. And I think that's purpose, purposely done. Um, there's probably a sweet spot within a certain range that organizations um, deem it cost-effective to actually pay the ransom. And, you know, they're kind of hovering in that space and are going to probably gradually start increasing it until it hits a certain threshold uh, of where more, more organizations don't pay the ransom. Uh, so in, in the event you do identify uh, systems that are uh, affected, uh, you definitely want to isolate them as quickly as possible. Uh, in some cases, power off systems if you think they, they may be impacted. So if it's in the process of uh, trying to uh, overwrite the NDR or uh, wipe the system, uh, you know, by pulling the power, you might be able to circumvent that process from fully completing and making some of the system more recoverable. Uh, obviously, uh, performing uh, uh, secure backups uh, and obviously taking them offline. Um, is, is going to uh, help ensure that if you are impacted by ransomware, uh, you're going to be safe. So securing the, the infrastructure, um, so making sure all those things are disconnected, uh, all your backup components are disconnected if, if somebody in your environment uh, is impacted is, is critical because that will help preserve that data. Uh, and then obviously, uh, uh, you know, hunt and look for uh, – residual impact or other systems that might be impacted that the, the actual, uh, you know, any artifacts you may have uncovered from affected systems, uh, actively be proactive and look across the rest of your, your enterprise. Uh, maybe the, uh, the wiping or destructive nature of the malware hasn't triggered yet, but you might be able to uh, identify systems that are in the process or uh, maybe there's a ticking time bomb, right? So it's waiting for a specific date and time to take act action. So proactively going after it, hunting for um, uh, any of that collateral damage uh, to definitely help mitigate, mitigate the, uh, the impact. Okay. Um, so th that was uh, all I have from a prepared uh, presentation around uh, the evolution of uh, destructive malware and some of the uh, trends in uh, you know, ransomware over the last couple of years. Uh, I just wanted to transition briefly into a quick overview around uh, Blue Vector and, and how Blue Vector could possibly help mitigate some of these threats. Um, so real quick, uh, Blue Vector is an uh, advanced uh, threat detection capability uh, focused at the network level. Um, it was recently awarded a uh, patent for zero-day malware detection using machine learning, uh, which is a, uh, a form of artificial intelligence. Uh, and it's, it's focused at uh, the pre-breach of the detection, so uh, of an attack. So, uh, the, uh, for example, the, the actual ransomware or the initial entry point into the network with an exploit or a spear phished email, uh, that's the type of uh, attack that it's actually uh, uh, built to detect. Um, compared to other technologies um, uh, that are looking at network traffic, uh, they typically – use some form of signature-based and or behavior-based uh, technology uh, to kind of perform a down selection of the traffic in the uh, suspicious objects uh, and do further analysis on a very small subset of, of that traffic, uh, which creates a pretty, pretty decent gap uh, in the ability for the adversaries to kind of maneuver 
uh, and try to bypass uh, detection. Uh, Blue Vector is a little bit different in how they operate. Uh, being able to do, uh, apply the machine learning to inbound file objects um, at line rate speed uh, allows us to do 100% of the inbound and outbound traffic. Obviously, uh, you know, we have to scale uh, with uh, systems to uh, and handle larger uh, traffic types, but uh, the intent is there is no down selection process uh, before the advanced detection component is applied. Uh, and then when it does detect something uh, suspicious or malicious, uh, it conducts target analytics where it provides a lot of context. Uh, so earlier I was talking about uh, time of being in, uh, of the essence and, uh, you know, the need for speed. Uh, especially around destructive and uh, destructive malware and ransomware. Uh, you want to be able to mitigate the impact and stop it uh, as early as possible in the process. And uh, uh, that's where, you know, having this context around any type of detection uh, really speeds up the analyst workflow uh, and gets into some of that automation. So you can get response times, uh, you know, measured in uh, minutes instead of uh, weeks or months. So I just wanted to give through um, two customer case studies um, uh, that are relevant to uh, the topic here. Uh, so we, we had a, a large manufacturing sector uh, customer um, who, uh, without uh, knowledge of any signatures, so the way machine learning works is there aren't signature-based detections. Uh, so we're using uh, machine learning uh, classifiers uh, that we update on a quarterly basis, and they're basically uh, – being applied to the static analysis of file objects uh, after we've extracted features from them. And we're applying those classifiers to those file objects uh, in the features to determine if they're malicious or suspicious. So uh, in, in this case, um, uh, the uh, Shamoon 2, the, the second version, came out. Um, without any signature content or being known in the wild, uh, we were able to uh, help a customer, one of our customers identify it uh, they had several attempts of it trying to get into their, their network and cause damage and uh, uh, because we were able to give them an early warning uh, of, of, the, uh, of the breach, they were able to uh, mitigate the impact uh, and uh, uh, in under seven minutes they were uh, able to uh, prevent any impact to their, their network. Okay, uh, we had another uh, uh, financial customer in this case uh, who was targeted by over 2,000 instances of JAF malware, uh, ransomware. And uh, it was being recompiled and different variants were being sent out to uh, hundreds of their users over a uh, several day period. Um, and the fact that we weren't relying on signatures, we were able to detect the different variants and the different attempts uh, of this adversary trying to get into uh, uh, the financial sector's uh, you know, organization and their network. Okay, and um, the last thing I wanted to talk about a little bit more was around the machine learning aspect and what does that really mean. So on the left column, I have some examples of some of the uh, different destructive and, and ransomware uh, uh, samples uh, in the wild uh, and the time frames for when they were first seen in the wild. Uh, so, so one of the things we typically do as a best practice is do what I call regression testing of our machine learning classifiers. So since we, we update, update these on a quarterly basis, uh, you know, we, we have them historically preserved. So w when a new piece of malware comes out, uh, we can go back and try different classifiers over the years to see when, uh, when and if we would have been able to detect it. So out of these uh, uh, destructive malware samples, uh, the column on the right shows when our classifier uh, was released that would have detected the sample uh, and obviously when it was first seen. So, um, you know, deployments of our product from 2014 without updates would have detected several of these samples. Um, NotPetya was a little bit novel in how it operated, but we still had a good, uh, you know, six to 12 month lead on uh, when it was actually seen in the wild from when our classifiers have evolved. Uh, and then uh, I think that wraps up the, uh, the content that I had, so uh, definitely happy to move into uh, a Q&A session now. Okay, great. Thanks, Travis. Uh, and that's exactly what we'll do. We'll move right into Q&A. Um, one thing right off the bat, because I do see a couple of questions asking about 
if uh, slides from the presentation will be available. And uh, as I was going to actually say uh, in, in conclusion later, uh, yes, there will be slides available for this uh, presentation upon request uh, in addition to uh, the uh, recording of the, uh, the webcast. Uh, so now moving on to some other questions. Uh, here's the first one for you, Travis. Uh, what role does Bitcoin have in ransomware? Uh, sure. So, you know, um, anonymity is key, right? So, you know, if, um, <laughs> you know, like, like anyone, if you try to destroy somebody's house or do some type of, uh, you know, irrecoverable irre harm, uh, you know, uh, typically uh, if they know who you are, you're not going to get away with it or, you know, uh, your behavior is not going to continue. So with Bitcoin, uh, it provides some level of anonymity. Uh, and it actually allows uh, for financial gain without actually disclosing who you are. Uh, so it, it's a it's a huge enabler as well as any other cryptocurrency that's uh, out there today. Um, so it, it's definitely uh, fueling the fire, if you will, um, in the, the growth of ransomware. Uh, and and you know it's it's um, you know it's almost fueling a new industry vertical, right? I mean, it's even though it's all criminal in nature, it's uh, you know, it's, it's really the uh, enabling mechanism for, for how this is growing so fast. Great. Uh, let's see, next question. Uh, do you think that destructive malware, if uh, perpetrated against a nation state, could lead to any real world, excuse me, real world international conflicts? Hmm. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I, I believe uh, it absolutely could. Uh, there was a uh, there's a NATO cyber uh, defense uh, center of excellence in Europe, um, in uh, Estonia actually, and um, there was a uh, a fellow there who was there during the creation of that organization and uh, discussed that um, even more recently the uh, NotPetya attack in the uh, against the Ukraine uh, was actually borderline touching on. Uh, that exact topic. So, uh, you know, definitely the, some level of destruction and, uh, you know, what that threshold is. And, you know, in most countries it hasn't been determined yet how cyber impacts, uh, you know, the military world from, from those aspects, uh, from starting a kinetic war. Um, but it's definitely, you know, we're getting closer to that point and, um, you know, uh, the discussion and having that plan in place and understanding that is, is uh, you know, I, I think we need sooner than later. Um, the other aspect I would say is uh, the attribution piece of it. So uh, attribution in the cyber realm is very difficult. And, um, you know, what we saw with not Petya, trying to emulate and look a lot like Petya uh, and be kind of your uh, run-of-the-mill type of ransomware, um, it actually had a much different, you know, uh, uh, focus and intent um, than what was uh, initially, uh, uh, you know, identified by the industry. So, you know, looking at the uh, – and a different focus on maybe who was behind it as well. So, you know, the attribution and being able to do that effectively, obviously uh, when you're talking anything with a kinetic war or some type of uh, cyber uh, – Cyber war retali retaliation is is uber critical, so I, I would say those would be the two biggest uh, components. So yeah, so the answer is definitely uh, I think we're moving in that that direction, um, but the attribution piece is uh, still that uh, uh, I guess the holy grail, if you will, that uh, that mythical unicorn uh, that we uh, we still have some work to do there. All right, we're getting lots of questions here. Let's pick another one. Uh, do you think the growth of Citrix environments and cloud processing helps to prevent malware damage? So, uh, so yes and no. Um, you know, uh, the use the use of cloud definitely mitigates and helps in some ways, but other ways it just transfers the problem into a different environment. So um, the, you know, uh, wherever the data still has some level of persistence, uh, there's still risk. That risk still exists. Um, so uh, 
in, in that case. So the, you know, your data still resides in some file share or um, some storage uh, somewhere that still could have a level of risk. Um, in the case of you know, ransomware, for example, uh, the ability to propagate in a cloud environment and uh, have impact is, is still there. Uh, even though it's not within your your physical space, uh, it's still being transferred into that environment. So I, I would say uh, there are some advantages, but there's also, uh, you know, uh, there's other areas that must be addressed. Uh, so maybe uh, some other uh, level of enhanced scrutiny of those files that are in the cloud or re residing in the cloud for permanent storage. Um, that, that would be one, one piece to maybe look to mitigate it to make sure that uh, nothing uh, malicious is there, but it, it doesn't it doesn't eliminate the problem. It just changes uh, the problem and how you uh, how you need to approach it. All right, a couple of interesting uh, questions here on machine learning. Let's maybe address those next. Uh, first one here is: Is there any evidence that malware is using machine learning to target individuals or companies? So I don't know of any specific um, use case or example where malware is specifically using machine learning as a means to target uh, a victim. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, that's not the case at some point. Uh, you know, I, I just used the example, um, you know, that, uh, for example, uh, you know, a lot of the major conferences, uh, you look at um, – uh, a lot of the vendors today, uh, you know, uh, the Googles and the Facebooks of the world are using machine learning uh, to target people from an advertising perspective. Uh, and there's, there's economies of, uh, and businesses built around doing such things. So I, I would not be surprised um, if at some point something like that would be uh, put in place, you know, using, using that around maybe social media data or other means to help target um, target victims. Uh, so I, I don't know of any use cases today, but I, I, would, I can see the, the future where that's possibly uh, used in the, uh, in, in, uh, at some point in time. Uh, you know, obviously, to help the success of, of the attacker and you know, as, as they have to uh, adapt, it could definitely be a means for how they adapt. Sure. Now let's talk about your own uh, machine learning. So I have a question here. What is your machine learning based on? Uh, is it looking at abnormalities in traffic or user behavior? Is it looking at static analysis, dynamic analysis, et cetera? Uh, talk a little bit more about that, and also how long is your average analysis time? Okay. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so our, our machine learning approach is uh, – you know, so so we're a, a, a network appli uh, appliance, um, physical, and we're moving to virtual. Uh, but essentially, what we do is carve. Uh, for example, we, we would carve off file objects, um, conduct static analysis, and extract different features uh, about the the the, the, uh, the object in question. Um, and what I mean by features, for example, if you have a, a, an automobile and you, and uh, a feature, you know, different features or feature set uh, of an automobile might be. Uh, how many wheels does it have? Uh, does it have a trunk? Uh, is it a hatchback? What color is it? What make and model? What year? Uh, et cetera. So think of something very similar, uh, but apply it to like a file object. Uh, so we're extracting thousands of file objects, uh, features uh, of the file object rather, and applying the machine learning classifier to look for, um, you know, the statistical model around what those features look like for either benign and malicious files. And we're applying that to determine um, never, you know, uh, without signatures knowing what's good and bad, we're applying that model to determine, hey, does this file meet the characteristics of something malicious or is it benign? Uh, and we're able to do all that within, uh, depending on some of the complexities and the dynamics of the files, uh, within um, a few milliseconds to, you know, uh, maybe 10 or 20 milliseconds uh, in, in some cases. But essentially, uh, almost line rate speed, uh, we can do that for um, you know, up to 10 gigs of traffic w with one box. All right, uh, next question here. 
Um, how does ransomware as a service fit into the uh, greater scheme of things, fit into the, the greater ecosystem of these threats that you described? Uh, uh, great question. Um, yeah, no, it, it's ransomware as a service. Uh, you know, it, it's it's another catapult for growth, right? Uh, much like uh, cryptocurrency, uh, the ransomware as a service uh, essentially allows a much wider set, you know, uh, an enhanced proliferation of these tool sets. So, you know, organizations, uh, cyber criminal groups. Um, you know, uh, you know, maybe terrorist organizations that are looking to raise money or generate some kind of income um, can, you know, uh, go to some of these sites on the on the uh, on the black market, the deep and dark web, and um, you know, leverage ransomware as a service, right? So if it doesn't work, then you know they get generated a, a new a new tool set um, that's you know dumbed down and very easy to use, very point and click driven. Um, and then they, you know, basically you have the same level of sophistication as uh, the person who created, created the tool uh, with, you know, some support on the back end to ensure they're successful. Uh, so I, I definitely think it's a real, pro- you know, uh, it, it's a real problem and it, it just makes, uh, you know, it just adds more fuel to the fire as far as, you know, what the impacts are to, um, uh, you know, companies, organizations, uh, you know, uh, it, it, uh, in the world. I mean, it's... Um, uh, you know, it's a growing problem for sure, and, uh, uh, you know, ransomware as a service is just another, <laughs> some entrepreneurial hacker, uh, you know, um, kind of putting that in place to, uh, you know, to create money for themselves, but also, uh, you know, it it, uh, it makes a lot of other people very sophisticated uh, and effective in this realm that otherwise wouldn't be. Next question. Um, so we know malware is evolving, but uh, specifically, how do you think uh, it will evolve from your own personal perspective? Sure. I, I think um, yeah, I, I think we're scratching the surface with what. Uh, on you know on the destructive side, I, you know I, I think ransomware is really focused on financial gain, and uh, it, you know it's growing exponentially almost. Um, but I think on the destructive side, you know, talking about CPS or cyber physical systems as defined by uh, NIST, you know uh, we're looking at uh, automobiles, we're looking at uh, Internet of Things with homes, we're looking at uh, you know, the self-driving cars, uh, you know, uh, UAVs, drones, uh, et cetera. Um, I, I think, you know, we're on the border of kind of Pandora's box, if you will. Um, if we don't, uh, you know, get certain things in place, whether it be, uh, you know, updating policies, uh, compliance requirements, or, uh, or you know, uh, changing incentives to, uh, to mitigate this threat. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, uh, you know, a lot of this, uh, these types of attacks start targeting um, more the consumer uh, and/or the cyber physical systems within organizations. So, um, all the HVAC systems, uh, all the IoT types of systems in office buildings, um, you know, CCTV, subways, um, things like that. I, I think that that's probably where things are going to evolve, um, and potentially on the ransomware side is. <laughs> You know, shutting down some type of mass transit system, um, you know, and, and starting to ask for larger amounts of ransom <laughs> is could definitely be something, uh, you know, uh, not necessarily science fiction, but something that could become reality in the future. All right, we have just under two minutes, so probably time for, I'm guessing, one more. We'll do a, one that's slightly more technical here. Uh, if I entomb my critical apps in a virtual terminal environment, uh, but keep uh, my email and general browsing on the terminal's operating system. Can this protect my critical systems from a malware attack? I, could you repeat that one more time? I just want to make sure I understood you correctly. Okay, so the question is, uh, if uh, I'm entombing my critical apps within a virtual terminal environment, 
but keeping email and general browsing on the regular terminal operating system, can this uh, protect my critical systems uh, from some of the malware attacks that you've been describing? Gotcha, okay. Yeah, so it, it helps with the isolation aspects. It helps preventing, um, minimizing the impacts. Uh, however, the, um, the, the, the data, so the, if the adversary is able to get access to run their code on, on the system, where, wherever that resides, uh, anything within its logical touch, and, uh, you know, where, where it can logically reach and with the permissions and access controls that it's allowed, uh, you know, what permissions it's given either from the, inherited from the user um, or through uh, some type of exploit to do uh, privilege escalation, uh, all of those things could be impacted. Uh, it, it could uh, destroy or uh, encrypt, you know, with respect to ransomware, uh, anything within arm's reach, if you will. So, you know, not knowing the, the specifics of uh, the technology and how it's implemented or, or uh, isolating from the rest of the environment, um, I, I can see an implementation where that would help mitigate the risk, um, but it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't eliminate the risk. All right, and with that, our time is up, and so today's session has concluded. Uh, once again, I would like to thank our guest, Travis Rosick, for joining us today, and thanks to everyone else for tuning in. Uh, again, as a reminder, slides from this presentation will be available upon request, and also this webcast will be available on demand beginning tomorrow on the SC Media website under the Events tab. And so with that, for SC Media, this has been Brad Barth. Until next time. Have a safe day online.